and weren't able to make it here today, they'll be able to see it on the, uh, on the HOA website. So, as, as always, we so, so appreciate what the Teleco Village Community Church does in letting us come and, and have our meeting here in their, in their lovely, lovely church. So, um, with that, I would like to invite uh, Reverend Devin up to do our invocation. Thank you, Sue. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've bestowed upon us. God, we pray uh, for our brothers and sisters who are recovering from not so beautiful days, those on the East Coast, those affected by flooding. God, those all over the world, in Africa and, and Asia where flooding has been rampant, God, we pray for them. We pray uh, that you'd be near in the recovery. Father, for our time today, I pray that you bless this time, bless this discussion, bless this fellowship. May we grow closer to you in it. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. Okay, um, before I get started though, and I'm going to mention this at the end too, uh, if your stomachs start rumbling toward the end of the, uh, end of the meeting, good news is there is a spaghetti dinner that's going to be in the fellowship hall, oh, we left. Uh, and everyone is welcome to join, so uh, just something I will remind you again at the end. Okay, today... You know, normally I, I, I just kind of talk a little bit about what's going on with the HOA in terms of next things up. But today we've got a topic I just really want to cover with you um, as, as we move forward. And that is the membership model for HOA as we move into 2019. So you will see that we're going to be making some changes to that model, and that's what I want to talk to you. The first thing, though, that it's interesting to know, and maybe didn't realize, but believe it or not, uh, the Homeowners Association will be celebrating its 30th year next year. Isn't that neat? So since 1989, yeah, I think. And I'll tell you what, that doesn't happen without a whole heck of a lot of volunteers that year after year after year give, and let me tell you, more than 40 hours a week. So it's kind of like you just move that excitement and effort into this. But anyway, so the, the thing I wanted to talk about is even though we've been here for 30 years, our mission has really remained pretty much the same. And you can find all that we do mentioned or referenced on the HOA website. We deliver value to Teleco Village Homeowner Association members through informative and engaging programs like the one that you're at right now, uh, promoting social fellowship, civic responsibility, and of course, our most important role, which is providing a voice for homeowners' concerns. Our goal for achieving our mission is quite simple. Your HOA wants you to have multiple opportunities, and you all know what I'm going to say, to be engaged, be informed, and to be heard. So since 1989, membership dues for the HOA has been $10. So for 30 years, we've been at $10, which frankly, that's a pretty darn good bargain for, uh, for everything that we see with no increase. So now is the time that we need to align our membership dues to the many benefits. I'm going to click my screen here. To the many benefits that are derived from being a member of this association. Here's some of the things to think about to kind of help you weigh that a little bit. Our monthly socials and activities are one of the hallmarks and strengths that people think about when they think about the HOA. In just five years ago, in 2013, the HOA offered 35 total events for the year. This year, we will be offering 120 events for the year. So that's phenomenal. And, and again, the amount of volunteerism that goes into making that happen is, is just incredible. Um, general meetings that require printing costs for agendas, where you are today, pamphlage, the signage that you see out on the roads, um, you know, the bylaws stipulate that we do this four times a year. In 2018, 
we will have done eight of those, five already, many because of all of the political uh, awareness that we wanted to be able to provide, and we have three more, well, including this one, to come. So, um, so there's a lot going on, and what the HOA has tried to do is say, okay, well, this is what we're, what we're chartered to do, but what do we really need to do in order to be the most effective and helpful to our community members? Uh, as well, we have liaisons not only to the PO, all of the uh, to the POA board and all the POA advisory committees. Um, T dot, you know, I mean, this is you're going to see what a great example of HOA volunteerism looks like when you when you see the T dot folks get up and talk. We have our Loudoun County and Monroe County officials too, who try to establish a good relationship with the, the communities in which we live so that they know Teleco Village is here and participating in the greater community. So, the way we think of it is now we're getting about four times the benefits on a 1989 budget. Shoestring budget, I think, is what we were thinking, and really no frills. And to tell you, we really don't plan on adding any frills, but we do need to be fiscally responsible. We do need to be able to keep doing the things that we're doing. So here's what we're going to look like. In 2019, our dues will move to $15 per household payable by check or cash, or if you choose to pay by credit card through Teleco Live, you'll get a $5 discount. And the other thing I wanted to mention, too, that we've decided on is forevermore, if you pay for your membership or an event by credit card, there will not be a convenience fee anymore. So I know that that might have been a hang-up for a lot of people, so that's gone by the wayside. And because we all love special promotions and prizes, what we want to try to do is, while you guys are thinking about this, through October to November 30th, if you pay by credit card on Teleco Life, because that's how you pay by a credit card, um, there's going to be, we're going to have a drawing of four really nice prizes. So um, we want you to be thinking about that and that there's a little bit of extra incentive to, to do this. So bottom line, your membership matters to us, obviously. We hope the community-wide engagement that your HOA provides matters to you. We encourage you to continue your HOA membership and let us continue to be your voice in the village. Okay? So that's membership. Um, so coming up, let's just talk a little bit about what's going to be happening here in the next few months. Uh, again, check out our, our, our website for updates on uh, the LUB meter replacement. Um, Mark Kovar's written a really great article that explains everything you need to know on that. So, uh, and also I would say too, to give a, a pitch for TVB as well as for the HOA, um, Ellen and Mark did a, did a nice little video on the, uh, on the meter replacement, so you can watch that as well to get more information about that. Uh, TDOT updates on the 444 repave and more. Certainly we're going to learn a lot about that today. Um, excellent events, all of that you can find on the website. Our HOA newsletter will be coming out in the next few weeks or so. Uh, we do that quarterly as well. Uh, October 11th is our next general meeting where you'll have the opportunity to meet our candidates for the POA for 2019. Uh, and then again, a membership drive. So our, our membership drive starts October 1st so that if you were to sign up October 1st, you would get the rest of 2018 and all of 2019. So, And then lastly, you know, we, as we said, I already said, we spent a lot of time 
with awareness of what's going on from a political perspective around the community and the state. So I really, really urge you to make sure you get out to the general election on the 6th. That's how Teleco Village and you personally have your voice to the community and, and to the overall government. So with that, Let's look at the rest of the agenda here today. So first up, we're going to have Dennis Danzig come up, who is the, our TDOT ad hoc committee lead. Uh, and that is the committee that works directly with TDOT in terms of uh, for things that are relative to Teleco Village. So Dennis will come up and he will introduce Amanda Snowden, who is the Regional Director of Operations for TDOT. After we get done with, oh, and the other thing too, from a logistical perspective, a little different than what we normally do, after each speaker presents, they will entertain questions at that time. So we're gonna do it after each of the, each of the presentations. Um, then Angela Smith from Five Star will come up and she will talk to us a little bit about what's going on with the independent living uh, facility that's being created. Then Marty Toms will come up from Stay in TV and talk to us about their respite care program. And finally, Keith Sanderson will come up and, and tell us all of the great things that Teleco Village Broadcasting is, is doing. So with that, I will turn it over to Dennis. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, Amanda Snowden, and she has with her one of her staff members, Jason Schultz, and you'll be hearing from both of them. Amanda is the uh, regional director for Region 1 of Tennessee Department of Transportation, and that region serves the 24 eastern counties of Tennessee. Amanda earned her Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from the University of Tennessee, and she is a licensed engineer. For the past three years, Amanda and her staff have been meeting quarterly with the HOA POA TDOT Liaison Committee and to uh, discuss their plans for the resurfacing of uh, Highway 444 and to talk about some of the uh, proposed improvements uh, that our committee has made. Because of the excellent working relationship and the thorough planning, uh, TDOT has been able to accept most of the pr proposals that we've made for improving safety and for improving uh, and maintaining traffic flow during the busiest times of the day. And for that, we're grateful. I'm also grateful that Amanda was actually here today because for the past couple of weeks, she and her staff have been preparing to provide equipment and personnel for uh, North Carolina uh, repairs to highways uh, because of Hurricane Florence. Uh, as it turns out, they didn't actually deploy, but they still prepared and were ready to go if called upon. So it was a very busy time for them. I'm glad that she's here. So please welcome Amanda Snowden. Thank you, Dennis, for that kind introduction. Well, I, you know, I started my... Uh, uh, traffic engineering career. I started as a traffic engineer with the department, but my career actually started when I was uh, very young and I was asking my mom about a traffic signal. And so I was like, well, you know, mom, what does that red light mean? And she'd say, well, that just means stop. And I'd say, well, what's the green light mean? And they'd say, well, that means go. And I said, well, what's the yellow light mean? And she told me, hurry. So <laughs> Miss, Miss, Miss Sue has, I, I, we have a lot of slides to cover, so I'm going to do my best to uh, hurry through these slides while still presenting some good information for you all. So we're, we're pleased to be here. I think we were here two years ago uh, to tell you about some of the projects and uh, I want to start off with just some general information about the department, just to tell you where we are as a state. And then uh, I'd like to introduce Jason Schultz. He's also going to come. He's our project supervisor, and he's going to walk us through real quickly uh, some of the projects we have going on. And also Alan Hull. Alan, wave your hand over there. Alan's one of our engineers in our construction office, also overseeing these projects. So I, I'd like to thank them for coming and supporting me today. So. Uh, the TDOT mission statement, you know, when, when our commissioner came into office, he taught, a lot of folks have mission statements where you are, 
And really, it was real simple. He said, I just want to be the best DOT in the nation. And so that's what we strive to do in everything that we do. And, and of course, we have the goals. You know, number one is safety, and we are, have a huge emphasis on safety. Efficiency, economic opportunity, a collaboration with our local partners, which is a great model for what we've done here in Tillico Village, I think, and also stewards of the environment. Um, so, you know, when Governor Haslam came into office, one thing that he committed to doing, and I appreciate, Sue, the, the conversation about your HOA, is that being fiscally conservative and being responsible and good stewards of our funds, and Tennessee has no debt on our transportation system. Actually, we're one in five states that don't have debt on our infrastructure. Tennessee, Wyoming, Iowa, Nebraska, and South Dakota all are, have, are debt free. Um, and he is committed also to continuing that through his administration. Now, that's been, while at the same time, for the eighth year in a row, Tennessee's transportation system ranks as one of the best in the nation. So, and according to CNBC, um, America's top states for business is Tennessee, and we've been second in the category of transportation and infrastructure. And doing all of that while being debt-free can, can be challenging, but we try to be as efficient as possible, and I'll go into some of that. Uh, we're also ranked eighth in total infrastructure investment, and our assets are over $20 billion, with a B, dollars in, in assets, and that includes all of our, our roadways and our bridges and all of the infrastructure that we have. Another interesting note, we all travel I-40, uh, if, if you ever do any traveling, and of course it runs 455 miles across the state of Tennessee. T in total, there's over 2,500 miles of I-40, but uh, the Tennessee section of I-40 is consistently recognized through our trucking magazines and, and through, through folks that come through our state as one of the best in the nation and the best interstate section of I-40 across the all eight states that it runs through. So these are some things that, that we're just proud of. I mean, I work with some of the best, most creative and innovative staff that, that you could ever find. And, uh, you know, we're just, we're tickled to be able to, to bring this. So we get questions a lot, well, how do you spend your money? And, and there's been a lot of discussion over the last year or two about funding and how our transportation system is funded. And as you can see, of course, this breaks down a big piece of the pie where it talks about highway safety and capacity is over almost 63% of our program. But if you'll notice that blue section where that 2% is, that's our administration costs. And those of you that have been in business or, or worked for nonprofits or things like that, that is a really efficient number. And, and that's something that we're really proud of. We have spent the last several years building our core competencies in hiring uh, a good, strong workforce that's educated and being able to be as efficient as we can and, and good stewards of what we're doing. Um, so the IMPROVE Act, you may have heard a little bit about this. This was passed on April 26th in 2017, and the state's portion of this new money goes to the Highway Fund, and this is actually intended to fund 962 transportation projects that were identified in the Act, and this kind of details what it was and those projects are divided up into these different categories. You can see capital projects, like Welcome Center renovations. A lot of folks forget that TDOT runs our Welcome Centers and our rest areas through partnerships with tourism. Uh, interstate modernization, dealing with congestion and safety. And having a reliable network is very important and making sure that when folks travel, they know what to expect. Um, our ITS uh, components with our signing and our uh, our camera systems that we have in addition to our incident management with our help program, the big yellow trucks that run our interstates, all of that combines to make our system as efficient as it can be. Of course, a big part of the IMPROVE Act was bridges, and we can go into that. This was the statewide picture to see how the regions uh, break down. Of course, we're in Region 1, and we hold true to that Region 1 standing, don't we? Uh, we're proud to be the number one region. Uh, but you can see there, we, we actually have uh, 275 of those 962 projects. And breaking it down even further, you can see how all of those projects break down. Um, so all in all, you can see about the $3, $3 billion worth of projects. Now for Loudoun County, now that we're here in the, in, in the seat here, you can see we've got four projects that are in the IMPROVE Act, with two of those actually being local bridges. Uh, one state bridge and an interstate project that includes the widening of I-75, 
Um, and so that's a total of four projects for a total investment of $209 million. And what I can tell you today is that since 2011, over the last several years, we've had $148 million in investment just in Loudoun County. And that, of course, the bridge itself uh, was around $70 million that we just completed. Thank goodness. I appreciate your patience on that. Uh, but we're tickled to have that completed, and I think that's a great asset to our community here. Um, and currently, we have uh, the bridge being 70, but $88 million currently under construction here in Loudoun County. So, so we, we're proud to bring those numbers and be able to be a part of your community and, and being able to bring these projects to you all. So uh, I'm going to bring up Jason now. He's going to go into a little bit of detail about the current projects that we have. And um, you also, I hope you all received a handout. Um, the handout also maybe has some more information. I don't know that he'll get to touch on everything. So it gives you just some other details about some of the projects going on and some Q&A. Uh, but Jason, if you'll come and we'll, we'll jump into some of these project descriptions. Thanks, Amanda. Good afternoon. Uh, as Amanda said, my name is Jason Schultz. I'm the supervisor of the Maryville Construction Office. Um, we have uh, all construction projects in Loudoun, um, Blunt, and Monroe counties are under my supervision. I've been on the job about two and a half weeks, and on my, right, on my second day, Amanda says, she sends me an email and says, you're going to do, uh, we're going to do a, a presentation for Teleco Village HOA, and you're going to speak, so here, get a presentation ready, and I'm like, all right, right into the fire, here we go. So the first thing I want to talk about is um, the, the bridge project, um, kind of the post-mortem on on how that went. Um, everybody knows it took longer than we, we really wanted, but we think it turned out really good and we were really happy at um, how it turned out with, you know, we were, had a really good partnership with Federal Highways, um, Loudoun County and Lenore City, and a lot of input from communities um, just like yours. Um, basic project info was two welded steel plate girder bridges and a twin bridge to the existing bridge on the east end that was a, a concrete I-beam bridge. Um, total cost of the project ended up being almost $72 million and uh, turned out really well. Got a few, uh, this pr project location map, um, you can see we're bridge one, that's the little short bridge, and then bridge two is the, the big steel girder bridge, and then bridge three is the where we added the twin to the, the uh, the existing bridge. A um, little history there, several alternatives were studied before we came up with the um, existing design that we have now. Um, TVA expressed an interest in removing the existing bridge on top of the dam for several reasons that you can read there. And um, we, one of the chief reasons is we wanted to widen it, they didn't. Um, we, we felt like we needed four lanes for capacity and, and that's what we have now. We also added late in the project um, a, a multimodal access path, pedestrian path, that's really, really nice. Um, that, was, that was a product of the uh, cooperation with Loudoun County and North City. Um, and just a few interesting little tidbits here. Um, it was a lot of material. <laughs> Uh, 980,000 cubic yards of dirt, that's enough soil. If you were to gut Thompson Bowling Arena, you could fill it one and a half times with that much soil. So it's, it's quite a bit. Um, the, uh, the concrete, if you were to fill a football field, sideline to sideline, back of end zone to back of end zone, it'd be 75 feet deep with the concrete we put in those bridges. Um, the um, weight of the steel is more than six 747s. That's the reinforcing steel on the bridge. So really neat and interesting project and uh, quite an undertaking. Next, uh, I want to get to probably everyone's favorite project right now <laughs> based on the calls that I get. Um, the widening of 321 and the intersection of, three, of 321 and Highway 11. Um, this project has probably been needed for a long time. This is a fast-growing area. 
And um, right now, there's approximately 39,000 vehicles a day that, that move through this intersection. And by 2035, it's expected to be north of 58,000 cars a day. So it's a, it's a lot of congestion. And we, you know, this, this is a project that we really needed, and it's really going to going to help with that. Um, this is just basic info about the, the project. Um, it started and they have until June of 2019. It's almost $13 million. Um, it's pretty much from Burger King down to the in, just east of the intersection. It's going to be widened and then of course the whole intersection configuration will be uh, widened and improved. Uh, little cross section here, you can see that there's there's going to be um, three lanes going each way, and we're going to have a little center area where there's going to be what's called a J turn. I don't know, let's go ahead and get to that. Um, and what that is is it's a protected turn area uh, delineated by a little raised curb. Um, enhances being able to safely cross traffic there. If anybody's ever tried to make a left turn across. Uh, 321, you know that it, it can be a little, a little scary. But these things um, are going to improve that and make it much safer. Area map um, for the intersection, just to kind of get your bearings of what I'm talking about. Um, I-75, Farragut, Lenore City, into, into Telco Village, or Maryville. Um, it's a pretty good sized intersection. There's a lot of, a lot of traffic there. This is a little sketch of the intersection. You can see on this that there's going to be two through lanes, two left turn lanes, and a dedicated right turn lane at all approaches. Um, in addition, there's really this intersection is really going to be nice. It's a signature intersection. We're going to have a um, Lenore City sign that's really nice and a lot of landscaping um, and really nice amenities at this intersection. It's really, really going to be quite an entrance to Lenore City. Um, this is the cross section at US 11. You can see these are the, the traffic movements. Um, two through, two left, dedicated left turn lanes and one dedicated right turn lane. And uh, basically the same thing on 321. Um, two dedicated lefts, a, uh, two dedicated through lanes and a dedicated right. Uh, so in addition to the, the traffic movements, there's a, like I mentioned, there's a lot of landscaping and, and things on this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip to the next slide for time. Street lights are going to be added to, to the intersection. Um, metal painted black um, benches, trash cans, stamped colored asphalt at your um, enhanced street crossings. And then of course the dedicated sign. Uh, a lot of really nice landscaping is going to go in on this. This is a rendering of the sign that's going to be at this intersection. It's really, really going to be, you guys are going to outdo Farragut. It's going to be nice. I'm going to move on to Dixie Lee Junction now. It's probably everybody's second favorite intersection. Now, this one's been needing attention for a long, long time. We've studied this intersection over and over. The traffic patterns have changed drastically over the years um, with the way people have been moving out to the suburbs. And it was kind of a notorious intersection. We had a lot of crash data that really suggested that we really needed to do something, and, uh, and we did. This project is almost done, um, about 90, 95% now. The only thing we're, we're really lacking is um, landscaping, and we have a little bit of handwork on the um, signage and traffic markings that have to be corrected. Um, this job was ended up being about $3.6 million. Um, and it, again, it has a signature sign for Loudoun County. Um, turned out really nice. It has a big detention basin. We put a nice fence around it. And it, it uh, actually turned out, turned out to be a really nice project. Pretty proud of that. And then we'll get to, actually, this probably is your, your favorite. The, the resurfacing, it's, it's getting ready to fire up. As a matter of fact, they're going to start paving Sunday night. They're going to start putting some leveling asphalt down um, and get going on this. This project 
you guys had a ton of input, some really good input, um, really helped us make some decisions that I think are going to make this state route uh, a lot better and, and uh, traffic is going to move much smoother. It's going to be really nice. Uh, this project, about a little over two and a half million dollar project, APAC Atlantic got it. And as I said, they're going to start um, paving Sunday night. The guardrail, any, any deficient guardrail we have on this job is being replaced with uh, brown powder coated guardrail, similar to what uh, you already have on 444. Um, it looks really nice and we want it to match. Um, I don't think, not all of it will be replaced, but anything that we do replace will be with that enhanced guardrail. Uh, guardrail ends also replaced. Um, this project is scheduled to be complete by the end of November. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Amanda. Thanks, Jason. Well, just to finish up, I just wanted to say that, you know, a lot of people ask us a lot of times, well, how do you know about what needs to be done? You know, there's so many needs across our state. How, how does leadership decide on projects? And one thing I can tell you is our TDOT leadership in, in our headquarters office in Nashville comes out to our regions annually and we travel the state through our region visiting communities and listening to a grassroots effort really um, to be able to listen to what the needs are. Well, that is what, that is what has happened here with the Teleco Village and TDOT Liaison Committee that has been so successful, I think. We you know, have met quarterly. It's been as uh, educational for us as it has been, I hope, for the members of the committee. Um, we, we've accomplished great things and we're real excited to have the completion. We started probably about three years ago talking about this resurfacing and um, you know that's when we have an opportunity to come in and really make some changes to the way the, the roadway operates. So with new signs and markings and, and obviously the new asphalt that's going down, we've had the opportunity to install some turn lanes and improve safety which again, you know, is one of the top things that, that we're always interested in. So um, I hope that by opening these lines of communication that you all as, as the residents here have felt that and have been able to be well served by what has been accomplished. But um, as I finish up here, I would just like to uh, thank the members of the committee and I don't know if you're here, but Bill Taylor, Ken Holland, Rich Comiso, Rick Carlin, uh, Lou Goydell, uh, Dick Sawinski and of course Jeff Gagley with our, our local office here. Um, I'd like to thank them but a special thank you goes out to Dennis Stanzik for really uh, been a spectacular mentor, uh, moderator, leader and has really become a friend I think uh, to all of us at TDOT and we, uh, we, we have enjoyed talking personally as much as professionally of late so um, thank you for your time I hope that this has proved informative and I guess we'll take a few questions if we've got just a few minutes yeah yeah yes sir uh, thank you very much for an informative presentation and I'm sure all of these projects that you're about to complete are going to be very much appreciated and will give you an even greater applause when they are. <laughs> My question is, I looked at one of your earlier uh, slides and it, the state of Tennessee has two major airports, one in Memphis, one in Nashville, but the one in Knoxville is not relegated or probably should be elevated to that status. And I'm just wondering if any consideration is being given to enhancing the status of McGee Tyson and or if there is any contemplation for having public land transportation between Nashville and Knoxville. I'm not aware of there being any planned transportation. There are, there are a lot of private um, groups that do that and really sometimes when those things meet a certain threshold is when public you know, involvement would need to be made at that time. Um, what I can tell you about McGee Tyson Airport is that it's really our jewel here in our region and uh, that, that obviously is run by a board. Uh, TDOT ourselves, we, we obviously provide some funding to that, but that is run by a board of directors through uh, Knoxville and Knox County and Alcoa. 
But uh, what TDOT is doing there, I, I can tell you a lot about what's going on with the Alcoa Highway corridor that we're building. We have seven sections. Uh, if anybody ever travels Alcoa Highway, you know the amount of traffic. We actually see more traffic on Alcoa Highway than some of our interstate systems. Um, and that's with at-grade intersections. <laughs> so so we, are, we are really excited as a regional corridor to be bringing these projects as we can. One of the projects that we're getting ready to let in the near future is going to be the, uh, the right there in front of the airport. It's going to be a new interchange at Hunt Road. Um, and modernizing how that looks, how the access looks. So I'm hoping that, you know, maybe that'll spur some, some additional infrastructure for them and, and be able to do, as you're saying, that's something maybe they can uh, think about doing. But we're excited for our part to be able to improving the access and being able to, as I said, modernize that to where we can accommodate the traffic growth in that area. Hi, Amanda. Uh, quick question on the resurfacing of SR 444 starting Sunday night. Can you give us, are you going to start at the north end? Are you going to start at the south end? Are you can start in the middle and work both ways. How's that going to work? And then in our lo local publication, it was estimated to be four weeks, but you sir said it would be eight weeks the end of November. And so can you give a clarification on that as well? Yes, yeah, so I, um, I'm not sure what they'll probably, what they'll probably do is start on one end and, and work their way um, to the other. I'm not exactly sure which end they're going to start on. Um, they are, we are going to be on site when they go out um, Sunday night. The first thing we'll be doing is leveling asphalt. So you won't see the big paving train um, that you're really used to. It's going to be some spot leveling for the, the worst failures, the, the, rutted, the worst rutted sites, and the bad spots on the shoulders. So, um, that's what will be going on at first, so they'll probably be hopping around to a lot of different locations on that. As far as the schedule, um, that's usually determined um, in design, and we get, gave them till the end of November. Realistically, they've already spent some of their time, um, and they'll probably, well, at least we hope, get done early. These paving jobs usually go by very fast unless we run into problems with utilities and things like that. So, thank you. Yeah, that, that's our hope, and that's some things we talked about with the committee is whether to do day work or nighttime work, and, and you know, with, with so many events going on, as you talked about, and being able to access, um, you know, doing your, your daily business, we felt like for the community it would be better to do it at night, and that was what the liaison committee had uh, voiced, and uh, so that's what we coordinated, and hopefully we'll be in and out and, and be ready to have a successful project. Those are... They're short nighttime hours too. It's, it's from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. So uh, we wanted to make sure we're, all the traffic was clear before they got out on the road. Um, that makes it take a little bit longer when we shorten those night hours up, but it it's really kind of gets it out of everybody's hair. On the uh, project of 321 and Highway 11, you have a very extensive drainage system. How do you get that over to the river? <laughs> That, so I always, if, if I get comments about this job, I get, one of the ones I get that's a little bit frustrating is, it, they're not, they're never doing anything. I, it looks like they're not doing anything at all. I see one crew out there and it, all this traffic is backing up and, and nothing's going on, but really what's going on is exactly what you just mentioned. It's, it's, it's the underground stuff. And there is a very extensive drainage system in there. I think the, the pipe diameters are there are 48 to 54 inch RCP that is carrying all this water. Um, so it is extensive and it's it's good size. It's not just something you can snap your fingers and and, and everybody you know nobody only, people only notice when there's a puddle on the on the street that makes you hydroplane and then they're like what's going on here? But so it is a big undertaking. All that all those utilities, all that drainage, it all has to get down to the bottom of that intersection. That's where it all goes, and then it has to go off to the river. And we, we are tying into an existing drainage system. So, um, you know, we can't, we can't say what's going to go on from there. But uh, for our part, we, we're up, upgrading it capacity-wise and um, pretty much redoing the whole thing. Um. Okay, I think we got time for maybe two more. Yeah. So. Excuse me one second. You, you have... 
You have three, you have uh, the extension on 321 to Simpson going to three lanes, correct? Okay. Yes. What happens when it gets into two lanes? How are they going to adjust the traffic there? When you go past <laughs> Simpson, you're it's going into two lanes. Is there a lane draw? So, yeah. Okay. So, there's a, this is the first phase of, of, of widening 321. There will be, I think there's future phases in, in planning. Um, but at that point, there will be, a, there'll be lane drops. It will merge down and will give plenty of room to, for that, that motion to take place. Uh, that's the way it has to, it has to be to make that geometry work. I don't, I'm not sure if that's a project. We don't have anything currently in development that I'm aware of, but we have the plans. Alan has a set of the plans. We can look at that with you after, afterwards if you'd like, and we can kind of look and show you how that tapers in. Okay. Has any thought been given into the lighting at the intersection of 72 and 444? The lighting, yes, actually. We, at seven, oh, 72 and 444, I believe we have a project there for lights, but lighting is a local uh, jurisdiction issue. TDOT, we give a permit for lighting. Typically that's done by either the city or the county through their, either their utility board, like in Knoxville, you know, works through KUB and things like that, but um, TDOT permits that, but we don't have any oversight of that. We, uh, we don't operate or maintain light. Same way with traffic signals. Those are operated by cities and counties, not by TDOT. So, thank you. So that's that it. All right, great. Well, again, thank you all so much. We appreciate being able to be here. Thank you, Sue. Take care. Thank you. Okay, now, uh, thank you so much, you guys. I mean, it's we just so appreciate everything you do for us. Okay, next I'd like to welcome Angela Smith up to talk to us about the five-star independent living. Thank you for having us here today, and yeah, this slides are a little backwards, and I was afraid that was going to happen, but that's okay. If it's okay with you all, I'm going to skip through, and I'm going to be doing the presentation backwards. <laughs> We were having technical difficulty yesterday, and Ellen was nice enough to come over and save them to a zip drive and bring them out herself. So, um, I'm starting off with we are Five Star Senior Living. Uh, we are a very large company out of Boston, Massachusetts, and as you can kind of see from the numbers, we do have total capacity, meaning apartments of 11,000 in assisted living, independent living is 10,000, Alzheimer's and memory care is 3,000, skilled nursing that is freestanding is 3,300, and skilled nursing is 2,400. So we are not new at independent living across the board. We are only new at independent living in this particular area. One other thing that's a little bit different with our Teleco Village project versus the others is the other um, independent livings we have acquired, this one we are building. And I do have to say I appreciate the HOA. Um, it was a project about four years ago that we handed the HOA and asked them to send out uh, questionnaires to all of the HOA members and ask what you all wanted in that building. Ask what you all were in need of in the village. And what we are presenting today is what you all told us you wanted. So I hope we've done a good job of putting together everything that you all had on your list. Um, care services, once again, it's a little backwards, but independent living by function and definition has no nursing services. Uh, we are going to have an agility therapy 
that will offer physical and occupational therapy on site. Uh, if you do come to where you need some assistance, we will be setting you up with um, home health, third party services, uh, assisted living and memory care, of course the building's right next door. So if your spouse, a significant partner that you're living in the independent living with requires care, you're welcome to bring them over and move them in with us in the assisted living or you can choose to take them home with you every night and, and bring them back over there during the day. Um, so you don't have to separate. Uh, transitioning to assisted living and memory care, it, if you live in the independent living, you are top priority, which means you go to the top of our list and as soon as we have availability, then you will get that apartment. Uh, the independent living amenities, we offer housekeeping services that will be offered once a week. They will come in, clean your kitchen, completely disinfect the kitchen and bathroom. They will dust, they will vacuum, mop. Um, they do ask that you put the dishes in the dishwasher if you have dishes. And uh, entertainment and activities, we have a 360 program which is um, 360 degrees of activities. We do intellectual, emotional, social, spiritual, um, and physical. And I know you all enjoy the physical. Um, uh, we offer a lot of outings, shopping trips. Um, being independent living, we will be able to take um, quite a few more residents to out-of-state trips out of Teleco Village trips to where right now we're a little limited because of the ability to assist them when they're out. Uh, lawn and landscaping services will be provided. Uh, outdoor hot tub and spa, the pickleball courts, transportation, the outdoor grills, they will be um, propane grills and it will be an outdoor kitchen. Uh, outdoor entertainment area, property and apartment maintenance, water, sewer, electric, POA fees, and property taxes are all included in that normal monthly rent. Uh, we also have a dining program, it's called Choices, and just a real clip, quick clip on Choices, uh, that means that you have a choice. You order off of a menu, you can have a chicken salad sandwich or you can have a steak and lobster. That is the differences in the choices program. Uh, socialization, we have lots of common areas so it's not only your apartment if you want to invite several of the different clubs that you are currently attend into the building then we have several areas that you can bring them into and you can cater those, those events. Um, as far as apartment sizes, we have two bedrooms down to studio apartments. It's seven total floor plans. Each apartment has a full-size kitchen with full-size appliances, uh, washers and dryers in each apartment, a personal response system, 24-7 concierge and security, a cable within each unit, the building is architecturally attractive and well landscaped. There will be covered parking as well as garages and they're placed in an area that will not um, obstruct the mountain views that we're, we're very in love with around here. We will have a walking trail that encompasses the entire campus to include the condo owners that are right behind us and the lots there that are empty. Um, each apartment well, you have your choice of apartments, whether you want the balcony or the large bay windows. And the dining room area itself does have the floor to ceiling in its two-story windows. An outdoor seating area at the dining room and the lounge. These are um, areas, area attractions that we teamed up with the architect, took pictures of, and told him what you all wanted and these are 
his inspiration for our model. This is the card room. You all said that you did like to read and you liked social areas. And that is on the top story. The salon and spa is on the very first floor. Uh, it will have pedicures, manicures, and uh, two massage rooms also. A multi-purpose theater. This area also has a pool wall that separates that into two different areas. It does have a capacity of 75. Uh, it is a multi-purpose theater room, which does have um, the theater seating, as well as dining while you're being entertained. Uh, the breakfast bar is um, set up downstairs, just adjacent to the dining room. So that is where the continental breakfast will be set up in the mornings. month-to-month -month lease with a 60-day move-out notice. Currently accepting two types of wait lists. The apartment selection is $1,500 non-refundable. Um, you select a specific apartment and take it off the market. You, you take financial possession within 14 days of a uh, certificate of occupancy. Uh, the general wait list is refundable. It's a $1,500 refundable deposit. Um, and you agree to take an apartment sometime in the future, but if your future changes, then you get your money back. And you do not currently choose an apartment with that option. After we open, the wait list does increase to $3,500. These are a couple of slides of the apartment selections that we have. This one's approximately 1,000 square feet. It's a two bedroom, two bath. It does have, like I said, the full-size appliances in the kitchen. And you have your kitchen and your dining room. And this particular one has a balcony. This is another option of the two-bedroom. You can, uh, you can kind of see it. it's set up really similar to the first one. So um, it also has the full-size appliances. I think the washer and dryer are in, are in different areas on those two options, and this one also has a balcony. Uh, bedroom C is kind of a pie-shaped. Once again, it's 850 square feet, but it does have the full kitchen, washer and dryer. This one does not have a balcony, and this particular room shape does not offer a balcony. This one is approximately 700 square feet, and it's a one bedroom, so you do have the one bedroom and the one bathroom, and the bathroom is a Jack and Jill, so you can get to it from your bedroom or from your living room. This is approximately 580 square feet. It's an open floor plan, um, so it, it offers the same amenities as the larger one bedroom with just a smaller footprint. This is the alcove, which is perfect for a single, um, plenty of space in it. It does have the bathroom that your guests can go to, and on this particular one, you have to walk around into the dining room to get to the restroom. That's all of them. This is a rear view. Um, we know that uh, about a year and a half ago, we were having some four-story issues with um, the fire marshals. So this is the, the picture of the building before the fire marshal would sign off. So now it does have a little bit of a different shape, but the outside, um, the rock, the brick, and the siding has not changed. Only a story has changed. And as we came down and lost that story, we came out toward the back. So now it looks a little bit more like a V than it does in these pictures. And this is the front of the building. And I think we've been through all that. That was a little bit backwards, but anyone that has been to the dog park lately or come out to visit... Um, they have really made a lot of progress in the building itself. 
I've been very impressed with how quickly they've put that together. They've got several teams that are working in different areas of construction in the building. Most of the ground prep work is done, so now they're rising. But if you haven't been out recently, then it, it would be wonderful to have you just drive out and, and take a look. Do you all have any questions? Couple of questions. Okay, there we go. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, from a security standpoint, uh, I'm assuming in the facility there are like in the bathroom if they, someone had a problem, they could pull on a chain and someone would come to the room. Do you also monitor the rooms or the uh, apartments for uh, movement? So for example, if there's not some movement in the apartment by 10 o'clock, you'll send somebody down to see if there's an issue in the, in the, in the facility, in the room? You're right now, the independent living uh, in West Knoxville, as well as the one in Fountain City, they have a card program which are little circles, and when they get up in the morning, they go out and they flip a card. If the card is on red, that's good. When they go to bed at night, they come out and they flip that card. If they go to bed and don't flip that card, you get a knock on the door. That's to make sure that they've gotten out of bed and they've come out and flipped that card. Does that mean we're probably gonna wake you up if you haven't flipped your card by 10 o'clock in the morning? Probably. But that's okay, we're making sure you're okay. Just in case something has happened and you didn't have the mind thought to push right. that pendant. Right, okay. And then the other question, just real quick, is there additional storage, a storage locker for each we, apartment? And then also what about uh, parking? We will have the garages if, if that's your choice for storage. And the storage that you will have in your apartment is your storage. We do not have additional on-site storage buildings. Um, I'm trying to get information, and when I called uh, assisted living, I uh, left my name and number, nobody ever got back to me. So I'm wondering, is uh, there a contact name or number, or um, like we've driven there, but mm -hmm. where do you go? Do you go to the trailer? No, no, you go into the uh, assisted living that's currently open. Okay. And, and we have a table set up out here. We have all the information. Okay. And one of us can talk with you now, or we can set up an appointment to talk with okay. you Thank either you. tomorrow or next week. Well, thank you for having me. I have a question, and uh, it's regarding pets. Mm -hmm. Are, will any pets be allowed in the facility? And if so, what kinds? Yes. It would be very bad of us to be located a thousand foot from the dog park and not allow you to bring your animals. <laughs> there, they are, there is a rule, I want to say it's a 40 pound rule. If it's over 40 pounds, it's probably too big for the apartment and can do more damage than we can repair. But <laughs> yes, you can bring your, uh, your animals with you. Offices remain in the current location or will it move to the new building? There will be two sets of administrative offices. There is three management from the assisted living that will be sharing both of those and everyone else in the independent living will be on will be new. All right, so, and, and to can kind of continue along on that same theme in terms of, you know, what's the next steps for everybody. Uh, Marty Toms, who's the co-director of, of the Respite Care Program with Stay In TV, is going to speak with us. Okay. <laughs> well, just review here. <laughs> I 
I'm just getting practice on this thing. Okay. <laughs> there I am. Oh, okay. Stay in TV is an aging in place project in Teleco Village. It's a part of a national movement that helps seniors to live in their residence before you move to independent over there as long as possible. Identifying changing needs and spearheading actions. The volunteers do the work and donations keep us going. There are four stay in TV programs, minor home maintenance pro projects, rides to doctors, appointments and other essential services, grocery shopping and errands, and respite care for caregivers. This was developed uh, last year by Marilyn Hockey and myself. And this year in January, Teleco University separated from stay in Teleco. Stay in TV has reference materials that include planning for lifestyle changes roadmap, which is a tool for downsizing and estate planning. And there is a sample out on our table in the back that you can look at. We also have a Stay in TV brochure that's available throughout the village, the Welcome Center, the library, and tonight in the lobby. And we have a fall prevention education but if we suggest you put a bar in the shower, we do not mean that you put the liquor bottles and the glasses. <laughs> we also have a resource guide for seniors, and all of these are available on our website, stayintv.org. Respite Care for Caregivers, which I'm involved with, is where a volunteer stays with a homebound person. This allows the full-time caregiver a short break, up to four hours, that they don't have to pay for. It gives them time to relax, refresh, and de-stress, and this is to help them reduce the negative effects of constant 24-7 caregiving. How respite care works. We get a call from our stay in teleco number, and where a message is left on Number four, it's a prompt you'll receive. This number is in the your Teleco Village directory, and it happens to be the last one on the frequently called list. After we get our call, a coordinator makes an in-home assessment visit, and there is a 21-time registration fee. The program protocols are explained, and a folder is placed in the home. This folder includes the duties of the volunteers and what they cannot do, the responsibilities of the caregivers, emergency phone numbers, uh, written instructions for the day from the caregiver. And after the assessment, a volunteer is scheduled based on availability. Respite care is really a concept of neighbor visiting a neighbor. And we're all in Teleco Village. It is not medical care, nursing care, emergency care. It's not all day, it's not overnight. And the volunteers all receive training and a copy of our protocols, and confidentiality is maintained, and a record of each visit. For respite care, we need more volunteers, and especially we need men. All our volunteers currently are ladies, and all our clients have been men. And when you become homebound, all your old friends that you played golf with or whatever um, often stop coming by and they just drift away and lose contact. So men, we need you to come and hang out with some guys. Just be a friend, uh, watch TV, talk sports. We do not ask you to do any nursing care or cook or clean. <laughs> just come hang out with a guy. To volunteer, you can just call the stay number, leave a message on number four, or you can fill out a volunteer form that's available in the Welcome Center, and tonight it's back on the table that I've set out. When you learn of a situation where a caregiver needs a short break, and if they're doing 24 hour for very long, they're gonna need a short break, suggest that they call Stay in TV. And to recap, Help us help your neighbors.
to volunteer or, whoops, I fell down on my job. To recap, you just call the stay number and follow the prompts and leave a message. And that number you don't have to memorize, it's in your telephone directory. Please be on the lookout for those that need help and suggest to them to call us. The stay in brochure is available throughout the village and I have them on the table in the back. So you will find all the information on the website, Stay in TV and in Teleco Life. So I thank you for helping us help others. And if there are questions, I'll answer some now and I'll be at the back table later. This is a uh, wonderful program. I think that, that you all have put together and are offering to the, uh, the residents here in the community. This is kind of a um, difficult question to ask, but are there any concerns or things around liability with the folks going into the home, provide, you know, providing the respite care and things like that, and, and how are you dealing with that? We are just your neighbor coming in to stay for a while while the caregiver's gone. So we're not taking on any um, responsibilities uh, we're not taking on any uh, giving medication. We're not going to open the bottle. If the caregiver has left written instructions uh, that they need to take, suggest they take this pill at noon, and they leave it, in the, they'll tell us where it is. It's, you know, in a cup. We will certainly say, you know, you need to take this now, but we are not giving medications. We have um, put in there about... Um, Guns, if anyone has a gun in the home, uh, they are to be locked up and they're to show the volunteer that they're locked up. We don't want our volunteers, even if they're licensed to carry, they need to leave theirs in the car. Um, we've tried to address quite a few things. We've, we didn't take on fall prevention. We'll leave that to the rest of stay in Teleco. Uh, we're trying to be just a neighbor, the good Samaritan neighbor. And we can call 911 <laughs> if we need to. Yes. Uh, do you have a feedback loop so that uh, um, there's any feedback coming from the person offering respite care? So let's say there was a conflict or an unpleasant experience. How would you deal with that? Oh, we have that built in. Marilyn and I are both nurses. We've both done home health. And so we think of it more like a chart I did try to call it a folder, so don't get anybody scared. Um, we ask, and it has um, happened, that after each visit, both the caregiver and the volunteer call the stay and teleco number and leave a brief report. And we were thinking we would catch problems, and they have just been glowing reports. And our people are so appreciative of, of this gift that you give to them. So that's how we have a report. We have a record, we have a chart, very confidential, but we keep a record. Any other questions? I have a question. Whoops. <laughs> oh, <Sorry>. pardon me. <laughs> yes, Sue. Um, okay, since I don't have this on. Oh. <laughs> so I was just wondering if um, a, a situation arises and say the individual falls or something like that, how does your volunteer handle those kinds of things, and then, of course, emergencies. Mm -hmm. Well, in this folder, there are the emergency numbers, and that is the caregiver's number. Um, several of ours have already been on hospice, and so there's the hospice number that they would call instead of 911. We also remind them that they can call 911 and say lift assist, if the person is just sort of slumped down, and that, and then um, they will come out and assess at the medical when, when our first responders come, uh, even just for a lift assist, they will um, assess whether it needs um, medical attention. And, we, and they'll also be, the volunteer will be calling the caregiver. Yeah, okay, good. Any others? Okay, thank you very much. Okay.
Okay, so now I would like to invite Keith Sanderson up to tell us a little bit about TVB. TVB. I want to thank the HOA for inviting me to speak and for all of you staying around on this uh, great afternoon uh, to listen to me. Uh, I'm TVB is Teleco Village Broadcasting, and I'm what's called a station master, uh, station manager. I, I'll get that right. And what that means is I get the paper clips and I, I do all that kind of work so the real worker bees can get those videos produced. Now, if I remember right, I ah there. Were, and people ask what I did before I came to Teleco Village, and I, it was a little bit of everything. And I came here expecting to go fishing, <laughs> which I do once in a while. But I reveal my true colors, and it's Teleco Village Broadcasting. And uh, it's been a lot of fun, and it's been an adventure. And oh, first a word from our sponsor. Uh, we don't have the audio on this. We're looking for volunteers. Hi, I'm Elliot Domans with Teleco Village Broadcasting. We're looking for volunteers. Be part of the team that brings TVB to Teleco Village. We're looking for some creative Teleco villagers to help us with music editing and archiving, producing, marketing and promotion, social media, webmaster, programming manager, IT, on-air talent, graphic artist, video editing and post-production, camera operator, director, and more. And what's in it for you? Well, an exciting and interesting outlet for your creative side. Regardless of your interest, we're looking for you. Contact us today at telecovillagebroadcasting.org. And that's some of the things we do. We have some fun. Uh, you may recognize Elliot Domans, the voice of Teleco Village Broadcasting. What I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about TVB and what the future is. And uh, for the future, we need a crystal ball. And the crystal balls are cloudy, but what we have to do is sometimes uh, know a little bit about the past as well as the present before we really understand what the future can be. So what I'm going to talk about is a brief history. Uh, four reasons. The viewership has increased since 2016 like a hockey stick. Bango. And there, I think there's some really good reasons. Talk a little bit about our volunteers. I mean, you talk about people who spend a lot of time. They're the model for the typical Teleco Village volunteer. Put out a lot of work, have a lot of fun. Uh, the future, and comments, and then wrap it up. But first, how many of you have seen the bulletins? You know, you see them all over. Every every uh, screen on Teleco Village. That's uh, when you see those bulletins announcing uh, HOA uh, general meeting, this general meeting. That, that's done by us. Um, in fact, we're on the track to do somewhere between 300 and 500 bulletins this year. Not a bad amount. That's only three people doing them. They keep busy. Um, and because uh, they're, they're dedicated to putting up the bulletins. And uh, if you want to do a bulletin, an announcement, if you're within an organization, it's real simple. TelecoVillageBroadcasting.org. Just go there. And then on the tab, submit a bulletin. Uh, open that up. And there's instructions. You put in your copy, upload a, a, um, a, a picture, if you want, a JPEG. And hey, you're there. And uh, it's a good way to supplement your your communication to, on the other areas. Now, 
We're not the oldest. We heard today that HOA was founded 30 years ago, but we're probably one of the oldest volunteer organizations in the village, 25 years. Just think about that. Think about what TV was like 25 years ago. Big changes. And we were originally Channel 3. Anybody remember Channel 3? Yeah, okay, we got some viewers. Uh, we were broadcast on Charter. Now, what's the downfall? Anybody here from Tahiti? Anybody in the audience? Yeah, can't get Charter, can you? So, uh, that was always a drawback. And people couldn't see us outside of the main village. So, in 2011, we uploaded our first program to the internet, to Vimeo. Does anyone know what Vimeo is? Vimeo is YouTube, only on a slightly different scale. We chose Vimeo at that time because YouTube would not accept some of the videos that, uh, with the length and the amount of data that uh, we put out. In the first production, and RecRap, rec you know, uh, which we still produce today. It's a great program. Uh, Larissa does a great job in bringing people up to date with what's going on at the uh, rec center and also uh, what new recreational activities there are. That was our first, first uh, that I can find on Vimeo, the first thing we posted. Now, since then, we've had as many as 165, I think, and as few as 65 programs produced a year. And, and when you look at it, it really becomes a flat. If you see that blue line, that's our production. Now what's happened, you see the red line, that's a viewership on Vimeo. And what we entered into was an evolution, a disruption evolution that was caused by the internet. And so as we trans as we go forward to 2012, from 2011, we had 417 views on Vimeo. Not very many. And it wasn't really until 2016, 2016, you see that hockey stick spike up. This year, we're slated to have almost, be somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of the total views. By views, I mean people watching us. Uh, that we've on Vimeo just this year. So something's been happening, and what is it? It's something that we're all familiar with, too, because it's been happening to us uh, who view TV. And as far as we're concerned, I'm concerned, there's really four primary reasons. Good we have better information and good content. We're the only broadcasting entity that broadcasts information exclusively for you. Think about that. And what do you get out of it? Okay, you don't get violence, you don't get drugs, you don't get sex. You just get maybe this meeting, or maybe an organization, or a marketplace, or what's going on. You know, this is yours. In fact, the reason we even exist is thanks to the POA. The P, our mission is to communicate, and the POA wanted transparency and figured this was one way to be transparent. So here we are. Marketing. You know, you can make a video about building a better mousetrap, but the world isn't going to beat a path to your TV screen, not unless you market it. So we've been doing more marketing than we used to. The internet. Has anybody noticed the revolution on how you watch content? How many of you watch content on your computer rather than TV? Any hands? How many of you watch content on TV on demand rather than waiting for the broadcaster to say, you will watch TV at 4 p.m. if you want to watch the news or something? Right? We want it now. So that's, that's one reason we're, we're, through Vimeo, we're offering it when you want it. And a great staff. Again, it takes a lot of work. Now, we're never going to be the networks 
In some way, I'm glad we're not, because if we were the networks, we'd be producing maybe high quality as far as technology is concerned, but maybe not some of the stuff we, you know, we in the village want to look at. So why content is improving? A couple reasons. One, the pictures. For instance, uh, that, that idyllic shot of the guy fishing in a boat, that's, in a recent, that's some video in a recent uh, uh, production we did of Teleco Village Naturally. We're doing more of that. Technology and our production and post-production people are incorporating this. We're using uh, backgrounds better. And things to enhance your uh, viewing pleasure. Marketing and promotion. We send, almost every program is, is promoted that we send out. We uh, either through uh, uh, an email list, and if any of you want to be on our email list to get programming updates with a Vimeo link, so you don't have to wait to see it at a certain time on TV B193, uh, just meet with me afterwards. I have a list out in the uh, hall, and we can um, sign you up to be on that list. But how many of you have seen the announcements on next door and what's coming up? And next door, it turns out, when I look at the analytics, is one of our bi single uh, biggest sources of uh, people who are clicking into Vimeo. Telegram, we usually have something in the Telegram. And then word of mouth. The internet. Now this, everybody knows the internet's a disruptor. I mean, look at, how many people remember Sears? Right? They should have been Amazon. They should have been Amazon. They had all the data as far as the different businesses. They had the products, they had the suppliers, they had everything. But this thing named the internet came along and what did it do? My goodness gracious, some guy named Weasel, Beasel, Basil, whatever his name is, he did what Sears should have done or somebody else, or Penny's even. So that's happening. Anybody watch um, uh, HBO series Succession? You see that series? Anyway, it's about a rich media mogul who's got a few gray hairs and his greedy children who want to take it over. And the oldest son is really incensed because the old man actually wants to buy some broadcast stations. And he calls them dinosaur. Well, that's today. And what does that have to do with us? Take a look at that one thing. More video content is uploaded in 30 days on the internet than the major US networks have created in the past 30 years. It's changing viewership. It's changing that whole model. And it's changing the way we look at TV and the way Teleco Village Broadcasting has to react. And frankly, we weren't the fastest because we were in the broadcast model. And the broadcast model meant, what did it mean? It meant we didn't really do a good job in, in, uh, on the internet as far as categorizing, tagging, and all that metadata stuff that you should do so people can find you easily. That was our fault. Shame on us. We were, I guess, the, like Sears or like Channel 8 or some of those guys. But we're changing that. So. And the reason we're changing it is because, as I said before, people don't want to wait to see content. The only content you're going to wait to see is the volunteers play, right? You want to see it live, so you're going to come in. By the way, that's one thing that streaming like this, people are willing to watch 40% longer than pre-recorded things if it's content ranch. It's a pretty interesting concept. And I'm going to when we talk about the future of TVB, I'm going to bring that up again. So what people are saying is, I want it now. And so we're starting. Now what we see here is, uh, like I said, when we started in 2004, we were a broadcast model. We're going back through now and categorizing all our stuff. So 
that top uh, bunch of little pictures, those are the, I can go to Vimeo now and just put in Teleco Village naturally if I'm looking for a good nature series. By the way, how many watch that? Good, good, I love you. That's my program, so. But if you like nature and you want to find out about nature here in East Tennessee, this is one of the most biodiverse areas there in the world, in the Northern Hemisphere. And that's what we try to do. We cover a lot of things. So if you want to learn about eagles or state parks, uh, we have even had Bill, anybody know Bill, who Bill Landry is? Yeah, yeah, we've had him as a guest twice, so we get some pretty good guests. And so you can just type that in and you can come up with all 13 episodes and take a look at what the ones you want. Or HOA, you want to see what the HOA has been doing? Well, okay, you type in HOA and what do we do? Uh, we come up with Highlights and Happenings, which is Annette Schmidt's uh, great, a really good production where she's, she's changed some formats and has some guests and keeps everyone up to date on the HOA. Or you can go back to when Rick Carlin was president and uh, interview of him. So we're, we're catching up with the world and I think it's gonna make, be a better experience because some of our stuff is timely and time dated, but other of our stuff like on PBS is worth going and taking a look at even if it's a year old. And by the way, for anyone who, who wants with an organization, you know, and you wanna p tell people about what you're doing, let us know because we can't, unless you tell us, we can't get out there and uh, be mind readers. And the most important reason, anybody know Harold? Yeah, what an amazing man. He's been a volunteer for 25 years. Okay, anybody out there with gray hair or no hair? Harold dispels the rumor about people with gray hair or no hair being like technologically stupid. I mean, here's a man who's, who is the premier pro, is a real snarly, a very efficient program to help in editing. It can like do three, three camera feeds at once. You can put all that stuff in. I mean, it really is cool. It's also a s snarly program. And our, people my age and younger are going, oh, God, what's happening? And here comes Harold. Well, it's probably operator error, first of all. And he's usually right, but he'll troubleshoot. Man in his 80s. Not only the software, but the network. The IT, you know, he's Mr. IT. And he's, he's a good example of our, our, our volunteers. And uh, the people, because th the technical ones really have to put in some time. But we also have produ producers, and we look like that ad said, we're looking for other talents too, so we can make the viewing. Um, experience richer. Now, why do people volunteer? As a hobbyist, I've been making videos for 25 years. I can make videos with a camera like this. Or I can make videos with a camera like this. Why do I volunteer at Teleco Village Broadcasting? Because now I can make videos with a camera like this. For more information on how you can become a volunteer, contact telecovillagebroadcasting.org. Or just email me at keith at maxapooch.com. Guess the name of my dog. Hi, I'm Linda Crawford. I'm an on-air interviewer here at Teleco Village Broadcasting. I volunteer because I think Teleco Village Broadcasting is necessary to our community. This is the one place you can get information about our local government, activities, anything that you need, any information you need, what's going on in our community. For more information. We have about a dozen of those, and so I, I just didn't have enough time to run them all. But, <clears throat> excuse me, we're running them uh, interspersed as commercials on TVB now. So thoughts about the future of TVB. Well, 
when you have a crystal ball, the future can be a little murky. I mean, who of us ever thought about the internet in 1980? Or what about the Swiss army knife of personal devices, the mobile phone, you know? We thought Dick Tracy's wristband was a big deal. <clears throat> but what does it hold for us? And this is something to think about. We're looking at, at showing content that's produced by others. And why not? Isn't that what broadcast stations do? Isn't that the model of what uh, stations do? And what others would we show? Anybody familiar with an organization by the name of Smoky Mountain Service Dogs? Yeah, they have some great video. Why not share their stories? And uh, talk to Mike, and uh, we're going to do some of their stuff, because they really do have some good videos. And there's some other organizations in town, in the village, that have some, some uh, pretty good pr high production videos. And we'll start showing those. So if you're with a group that has something that you think you'd like to show that you produced, uh, let us know. We have right of, of refusing, because uh, we don't want to get into politics and um, some other areas. But basically, you know, give us a try. Being utilized as a marketing tool, and going back in advertising history, I think it was, was it Packard who said, ask the man who owned one, do you remember, Joe? Or, or was it, it was one of the car manufacturers. Classic advertising um, campaign. And what they were saying is, ask the person who has one, because the best testimonial comes from somebody who lives here or owns a product. And, you know, I, I tried it. Um, one thing we, that's great about the internet is I can take a look at the analytics on Vimeo, and I can say, okay, how many people in Deerfield, Illinois, have looked at us in the last month? I'm sort of curious, because Deerfield is where I, we relocated from, and I've been telling some friends about us and sending them some stuff. Two. It's not bad. It's only 15,000 people live there. So, so, but the point is, it's a great tool, particularly if you're trying to show your neighbors or friends either why you moved to East Tennessee or Teleco Village or um, why they should move. There's a lot of great content, which supplements what the marketing department does. Because what this is, is this is getting down to Ask the person who owns one. The Teleco New Villagers video is a great example. There, it, you know, it's a slice of life of what a new villager experiences. And last, but all uh, um, I want to talk about is, you know, one of the things we're looking at is strain on facilities. Uh, where do we have meetings? You know, and there's a lot of answers to how to take care of that. Better, better timing of meetings and allocating, or do we, or in questions, do we need to build new facilities or build additions? And one is, you know, perhaps, because I was just at a meeting, had a wonderful speaker, Civil War speaker, but the audience was limited because the seating was limited, so not everybody in the village could see him who wanted to. So part of that is what the church is doing now, what Mark back there is doing so well, is streaming and recording meetings so they can be utilized by people who can't make it or, want to, or just want to see it later on their terms. And what does that do for the price of a dedicated room that exists somewhere? with uh, just uh, the price of a couple permanent cameras, some lighting, and uh, audio, decent audio, because that's really important. You can see here how important audio is, because my voice carries like a stone So if I were trying to talk without a microphone. But you all can hear me, right? Yeah, what? <laughs> okay. so. You know, that, and that price 
can be a lot lower than the cost of uh, uh, new rooms or whatnot, and much more flexible. Because then if there's a POA meeting and it's overcrowded, well, people can watch. Now, we tried that a year ago, that experiment. But things have changed so much in the past year that I think we ought to really take a look into it again. So, um, complaints, comments, compliments, or we can all go home. Anybody have any questions? Oh, come on, TV doesn't baffle you that much, does it? Anyway, if you'd like to be on the mailing list, uh, I have a t I'm out at a table out there, and if you're not getting our mailings, if you'd like to learn more about us, our monthly general meeting is at the POA conference room on the 25th at 9 a.m. And um, if you have any ideas for programming, uh, remember there's three ways you can program. One, with the bulletins. Two is what what Annette is doing for the HOA. And three is what you saw Elliot do. And just a quick 60 second PSA public service announcement. Thank you. Thanks so much. Oh, Appreciate it. Oh, All right. Yes, I sir. One, thing. Oh. I, one more thing. One, She's, she's going to say it too, but when you make a uh, promise to a pastor, you need to keep that promise. And I promised Devin I would remind everyone about the spaghetti dinner oh, that's going okay. on. So oh, you don't you have stole to. stole my thunder. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Are your tummies rumbling? Okay, well. Time to go to the spaghetti dinner. So um, thank you all. Um, does anybody have any questions for the HOA? No questions. You're all happy. Good, good. Oh, good. I'm glad. So just make sure you renew, and we will see you for the rest of the ed in October. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>